Are you looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash bluewire and use code bluewire. That's code bluewire at prizepicks.com slash bluewire for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to cars.com. It's magical. Hello, friends. Josh Bone, Kirk Henderson coming to you once again. The Mavs Moneyball feed coming to you endlessly. Just a endless onslaught of Dallas Mavericks content from Mavs Moneyball. You're joining <laughs> us on what day is today? Monday? Yeah. Yes, it is Monday. Only, only Monday. Dallas Mavericks <laughs> just beat the utah jazz 124 to 111 for only their 10th road victory of the entire (laughs) season and they did so obviously without luka Doncic, obviously without dorian finney smith who is now a net and spencer dinwiddie in the same regard and this was one of the weirder more entertaining games that you're going to see all season um it's it's just the perfect game for team confirmation bias. Um, <laughs> it's funny because they play the Jazz, right? And the Jazz got off to a hot start because nobody took them seriously. Everyone thought the Jazz were going to be bad and were going to be tanking. And for a significant portion of the stretch or season, they were in the top four in the West. Um, and then tonight against the Mavericks, they did not take the Mavericks seriously they very clearly thought that they were going to come out and experience a cakewalk. They did not. And they ended up taking the L at home. Really? I mean, this is a big win for the Mavericks. They're 20. They, they bump back up to three games over 500. Um, this win guarantees them going into the all-star break with a, well, I guess that would have, yeah, with an above 500 record. Um, had they lost tonight, they would have been just one game above 500. And, you know, if they would have lost to the Clippers on Wednesday, it would have gone into the trade deadline at 500. But, I mean, I just – I you know, you didn't get to see the whole game. I watched most of the first half. Like, this was just – this was a real fun performance. I mean, you, you want to lead – like, there's a lot of discussion to be had about Josh Green, who pl- who finished with a, a Maverick season high in plus minus, a plus 39 in 37 minutes. He's really – I mean, it's not quite this simple, but he's basically the reason that they won the game. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it was <clears throat> it was a pretty extraordinary effort. Um, I mean, if you were to tell me, you know, not only the people that missed the game missed the game, but then Christian Wood and Tim Hardaway Jr., who are you would presume are your two best offensive players remaining, yep. combined to shoot six of 23 from the floor. And the Mavericks still make 15 threes and score 124 points in a road game is outrageous. And of course, that happens because you're two, the two youngest players on the team with promise, uh, yep. score 29 points each, you know, combined to almost score 60 points. So, well, I want to talk about each of them individually because, okay. and we'll just kind of focus on them because I, I do, I don't really want, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk about Tim Hardaway missing, you know, we should probably give Dwight Powell a little bit of love, hilarious 16 rebounds, eight of them offensive. Yeah. Um, but I really, you know, I joked two games ago. So before the Warriors game, when I thought Spencer Dinwiddie wasn't going to play, I made a joke about how, you know, we need to be more excited about point Josh Green and Josh Green only ended up with two assists tonight, but he initiated a ton. Um, the Mavericks did a lot of like obviously ball handling around the the fringes, and so everybody got a chance to do it. 
but the way Josh played was really just taking advantage of situations that were put in front of him, you know, just making the right read, the simple read and executing. And what I'm curious about, I actually sent a message to our friend Bobby Corella about this a couple of games ago where it's like, at what point does the scouting report on Josh? <laughs> because they're not like, they're not guarding him on drives. They're also not guarding him on shots. Like they're, I'm going to go to, who's the guy you uh, he's a center number 20 for the jazz. Yudoka as a I feel like he played at Kansas. Um, big fat stiff. Like he had a belly. He was embarrassing. And he just didn't guard green on a pair of corner threes. Green missed the first one badly hit the second one. I mean, I, I that guy, that guy needs to go. Oh, he was awful. Like that's the kind of performance. If I'm watching him as a guy, I want his ass shipped out. Um, I was, I was just really impressed with Josh. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, teams need to update their scatter reports. I think you tweeted that. I mean, teams are still guarding him like Tony Allen on the Grizzlies in some way. Maybe not, you know, not that extreme, but I mean, they're just giving him space. I mean, I don't want to. The Jazz defense is awful. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I'm really, like bottom like four. This, yeah, yes. just as bad as our defense. Or worse. It's worse. Um, they have the 26 worst worst defense in the league right now. The only teams below them are Portland, Houston, Detroit, and San Antonio. Three of those teams aren't NBA teams, like trying to win NBA games. Mm-hmm. So Jazz are still trying. Yeah, Jazz are still trying, and they're 26. Um, so again, that's not too. That's not to mitigate the the accomplishment. It's just like a thing that's like, hey, this is this is part, you know, this contributed to to what happened. And you know, there were times where Green and even Hardy, like it's just one dribble and it was layup, or it was one dribble and then wide open corner three. Uh, the Mavericks had uh, thirteen corner three pointers tonight, which is a pretty pretty good number and again corner threes i think are a direct result of you know dribble penetration in in the defense you know bad defense because if you're a good defense you're trying to limit corner threes you're trying to limit rim attempts uh and the mavericks were 13 of 18 at the rim not a crazy high number but 72 percent at the rim so they scored when they got there and then when they didn't score they passed it out for a corner three and they were eight um eight of 13 on corner threes so uh, I mean, the jet, it was, it was, it was a combination of one of the most entertaining performances I've seen from a Mavericks team in, in some time. It was fantastic that the guys that did it are the guys that are going to be hopefully building blocks, uh, for kind of the next push of Mavericks basketball under Luka Doncic. But like, I also just can't emphasize enough that that was like an embarrassingly shameless performance by the Jazz. Yeah, at home with two nights, they had two nights off coming into this game. You're right. You know, they. We've, they I've saw, seen we've seen Maverick performances like that. That's what was killing yeah. me. Where it's like you could tell that Laurie Markin, in particular, who had two really weird oh, yeah. charge calls, he thought he, he was, was gonna score forty mm-hmm. on like ten shots. Mm-hmm. Like he thought he was gonna have a, a shoot around tonight. Yeah, uh, I. So. I, I was but, really. <laughs> but again, like you said. Even if if that's how they're like Green can't dictate how teams are guarding him, so he took right at some point he, he's at some point he's going to get respected a little bit more. And and I just want to take a second to talk about why I think he'll be okay once the scouting report changes. At a certain point, people aren't going to let him get a full head of steam at the basket. That's happened on repeat. It happens in transition where teams just don't pick him up. And I think that's because the scouting report on the Mavericks is they don't push. Luka doesn't push. Different deal. Kyrie Irving actually pushes a little bit. So I'm going to be interested to see how Green and, and Irving play together. Um, the, the second thing is the shot where he is clearly not getting like he shoots he's shooting like 41 percent. I mean, it's not a ton of volume, but he's shooting like above like slightly above 40 percent from three. And if he's only getting these corner looks, you got to stop that. It's the same shit that Dorian was getting in, um, you know, the late, like the late first half of Luca's rookie year, where all of a sudden Dorian went from shooting 30 to 38% on, on looks just because he's getting these chances. Mm-hmm. And Green's obviously a much more dynamic player off the dribble, but it, it just, it feels like teams have had gotten 
decided to sort of, okay, we're going to put one of our worst defenders on Josh Green and worry about everyone else. I mean, he and, was being guarded by Kelly Olenek in the fourth quarter. Uh, like, yep, yep, like yep. not a switch. Like, that's what the Jazz did. It was Right, and that has to stop at some point. And if that stops at some point before the Mavericks hopefully make the playoffs, then what we're going to be looking at is a much more difficult-to-guard Mavericks team. You know, there's like a cascade effect where if you can't put a bad defense, like if you can't hide a defender the way the Mavericks hide Luka on people sometimes, it just makes your team harder to deal with all the way around. So it's, you know, it, it, this is a game where I, I think people should celebrate and be very oh, excited. F- super. Yeah. yeah. This, because- you know, this is, I get pissy at some of these games where it's like, oh, Josh Green scored. He scored eight points. Did you see the <laughs> <laughs> like, Yeah, they were. Like the 29 point stuff, now is the, like, like that's something there. to be really thrilled about because that's the things we've seen some of the guys that he was drafted around do. Obviously, right. he's not going to get a chance to do this night in and night out because it's a volume issue. 17 shots for Green has to be a career high for him. If he's able to ever average 10 field goals a game, I think the Mavericks are going to be in an interesting place. I really, really do. Yeah, for sure. Um, and again, like it wasn't like, Tim and Powell had the huge, like, it's literally the two guys that you're like, okay, these, like, these are the only two guys on the roster that played tonight that we can imagine still being on the roster when Luca is 28 years old, you know? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So like, that's, that's huge. That's good. You know, it's just good to see, see those things. Um, and with green, I, I just want to emphasize, like, this is a guy that hasn't played that much basketball like not only just because of his youth but i you know i don't know when he took up the game uh but you know like uh this is advertiser content brought to you by frito-lay hello i'm chip murphy here to get you ready for the big tournament tonight we'll break down we break down who will be cutting cut what are you two doing sorry chip Prez here got his feathers ruffled when I told him Ruffles has zero chance of winning the title. And I was letting Dip know that she is not taking into account Ruffles' iconic ridges. Guys, it's March. We have to start talking about the tournament. We are. It is the 2023 Frito-Lay Snackin'. We're talking about big-time matchups between Cheetos, Smart Food, Lay's, Sun Chips, and more. Just head to the Frito-Lay Snack Bracket and vote for your favorite chip, pretzel, or dip for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. This sounds great. Keep up the good work. Just go to frito No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes ends 4-3-2023. Void wherever hidden. Here's worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Our guy, Ricky, uh, Ricky O'Donnell at SB Nation, he was like, I saw this guy play in high school, and he was like, like he couldn't, like, he had no off, like, he just had no offense. Like, he couldn't no. dribble, he couldn't I mean, drive. he was shooting 40% at the rim at, at University of Arizona. Yeah, and it, rim and finishing then, doesn't improve. That's and, the, like, <laughs> and what's crazy is he went from that to basically two pandemic seasons under Rick Carlisle, where he didn't mm, play, very and he good didn't take. get, and he didn't get summer league, and he didn't mm-hmm. get a real off season. And he, he never got no summer league. Camps. No, but and that's like, one of the things I think the Mavericks did the most d- did him the most dirty by is they did not put him in situations where he would be challenged. I, so I really. I don't it's like, lie. It's where like did the develop? Yeah, like where did the develop? Like the development comes from from being on the floor and then you know off season and, and training camp and stuff like that. And it's like he basically didn't have an off season for you know because of the pandemic. Like you know summer of 2020, 2020 like he literally couldn't. You know no one could really leave the house. Like it's not like it's not <laughs> like he got to go to the gym and was still playing five on five. You know like. Mm-hmm he had his development stunted in a way that that can be really harmful for young guys. Yep. And we see, and Hardy is kind of the same way. Cause I think his high school season got cut off uh, because I think his high school season was what in the, it was 2020, I think. So his senior season. So uh, it's just, it just, it makes it all the more impressive that he's done this. And it's, I, I don't know. Like I, you ask anyone, even 
the most optimistic of, of Mavs fans or even media members after they watched him that rookie year and said like, Hey, do you think this is going to be a guy that can score 29 points in a road win? And, and no one would have said yes. I mean, no one would have said yes. So he has gotten to a point where he has kind of set the bar for, like you, like you said, he has set the bar for himself to where if teams are going to guard him like this, he can punish them. The next step will be, of course, teams adjusting. Then he has to, adjust, you know, he'll have to, he'll have to grow even a bit more to make it past that adjustment whenever teams kind of recognize uh, just how much uh, skill he's developed in the last two years. So we'll see, but man, it was really, it was really fun. I mean, and again, you know, it helps to play the Utah Jazz, you know, they're going to play the Clippers on Wednesday and you might not score that many points. And that doesn't mean we kill them and be like, I told you. It's It's just, it's just how the, it's being a young player in the NBA, you know? Yep. The funny part is, so I'm looking at the box score again. I guess I didn't realize that, like, the so kid went with a kid went with McKinley Wright the fourth, who had 10 points, but was a negative 16 in 20 minutes. Wright going into the game, what, like, and I understand why he went with Wright over Hardy because you wanted a true point guard on the floor. Hardy is not, Hardy is a guard at best. Um, I, I, he's a scorer first, but when Hardy entered the game, was when a lot of things started to go right for the Mavericks. You know, he had a whopping team high nine free throws, made all nine of them. Um, this was this was one of my more one of the games where I really enjoyed watching how he scored. You know, he he needs buckets to get going. Now the nine free throws don't indicate just how many times he was driving at the rim. You know, he got, he got his shot sent packing, I think three times, Um, which, which means that if I'm doing the math correctly for his eight of 12 shooting, you know, you back out those three kind of forced rim attempts. He was like nine, eight of nine from the floor, which is mighty dang impressive. I mean, I, I am not, it's, it's going to take a lot to sell me on Hardy over the long run. I'm just, you know, just me. Um, part of it is I I I don't want to hear the phrase Hardy Party screamed nine times mm-hmm. at me on the broadcast anymore. Mm-hmm. It's just me. It's a small thing. But the second thing is is just like smaller shooting guards. It makes me wonder what the ultimate upside is. Um, that said, when his shot was going and it was clearly going tonight, it was really fun to watch. He has a little bit of a low, like not low release. It's like a, it's not a high arcing shot. It's, it's, it's not a straight, straight on shot or anything like that either, but it's just, you get kind of the feel very early in his release point. If it's going to be a good, if it's going to be a good look. And there was this, this war crime of a um, pick and roll with Theo Pinson and JaVale McGee (laughs) where Theo passes it out to Reggie in the top, it was top left, top corner of my screen. So it's the left side of the floor. And Hardy makes this. the The ball went in, so I'm, I'm, I swear I don't mean to. He makes this little like he swings the ball back and forth the way my five year old does before he makes a jab step, and it's like, duh, 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 and then just steps back into a gorgeous corner three point shot. I mean, it was well defended, and it just went in. And that's the kind of shot, the the tough shots. Like I think he is capable of making tough outside shots. He's just a little bit volume dependent the same way Tim Hardaway is to where if he's only getting four looks a game, I'm not sure what good that is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, Because, and especially with him, like the rim stuff is going to be, that's probably going to be his weak spot for a while until he But he's relentlessly attacking, which I like. Right, that for sure. And like he is going to sink or swim the NBA with his jumper. Like mm. I think there's no question about it. So seeing a game where he goes four or six from three, hits some really nice mid-range looks, like he's going to have to be a guy that hits mid-range jumpers because of his kind of tweener athleticism where he's not like a slow poke, obviously, but he's also not big. Like he's he's thin and he's not necessarily a guy that's going to, has blinding quickness. So it's kind of like, he's kind of had to have a little bit of a shifty in between game. He needs to have a good floater game, but again, he just needs, he needs to be able to hit jumpers and we've seen him play some games and he's gotten good looks and just not been able to, to knock them down. Um, and this was one of his more complete, you know, I mean, he scored 29 points. So obviously it was his most complete game he's played in the NBA, but 
uh it was I, I it was really nice to see him make three like he made four threes that's a career high and i think the kind of game he played tonight is gonna maybe be like a blueprint for what he needs to do going forward to be a regular contributor in the nba until he can solve the problem at the rim which might require more development might require you know transforming his body more i don't know what it's going to require but until that moment happens he's going to be a jump shooter mostly. And that's okay because he's got a really good handle and he can get that separation. He can dribble. Yeah. So. Yeah. I I don't, the the blueprint for this team going forward, (laughs) because let's like make no mistake. They are extraordinarily small Um, with the players who you want to see on the floor. You have Kyrie who's six, three Hardy who's six, three. I cannot wait to see these two standing next to each other because I have a bunch of people that tell me that Jaden Hardy is six four, which makes me wonder if I'm if I have no idea how tall I am, because um, <laughs> I've stood next to him uh, in in summer league, and that's you know it's just a jokey thing where it's just like and then you know Kyrie six two six three, Luca's a stout six seven, um, depending on what shoes he has on. Powell is six eleven, and he does the short wingspan. And then, you know, Reggie's maybe 6'5". Tim Hardaway's mm-hmm. maybe 6'5". Maxie's 6'9". Um, when he comes back, he's not... Yeah, Maxie's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Maxie's a good... I, I forget about Maxie, which I shouldn't. Um, but the the guys that we want to see play... Josh Green, 6'5". The guys that we want to see play are not on the upper end of, like, that 6'4 to 6'9-ish, like, do everything wingspan, like the Toronto Raptors are able to throw out. So... Mm-hmm. <sighs> If they're going to do this, and it seems to be, you know, I'm going to be very interested to see what kid tries. Um, if they're going to do this, I think they have to play faster. I don't think you can get away with this 30th pace in the league bullshit that Luca wants to do. Is that is that an overreaction to this game? No, I don't think so. I mean, you gotta you gotta you gotta play to your strengths, and if you're going to play Green more, like one of his strengths is he's good in transition. So. Mm-hmm. You're limiting his effectiveness if you're going to walk the ball up the floor every single time. And, you know, Bullock has turned his shot around, you know, get in transition so you can get him more. Like, how many corner threes has he gotten lately that I feel like are, you feel like he's been really good at the transition corner three uh, the last, like, four weeks? So mm-hmm. that's stuff that's going to help him. And obviously, you know, helps Hardy as well. Like, the decision-making is – the decision making for younger players is so much harder in the half court than than on the like, on the break. You're not thinking as much. You're you're kind of reacting more. Um, and the half court, you know, there, there's just way you know teams can scheme in on you. It's it's way more difficult for younger players. Like the transition game is just yep. it's just easier for these guys because it's a little bit more freeing and it's a little bit less pressure and there's easier situations that you can create uh, mismatches and advantages in transition. So. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you talked about, like, their size. Like, and, and Dorian was, like, the only big wing on the roster. Like, Bullock's a wing, but he's he's a little bit smaller. Like, you know, they they just don't have a lot of six, seven, six, eight wings. Like, they don't sure. have any right now, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, so that you know. You're going to have to play a different way a little bit. So, so here's a take I got to run by you. That is not my take. On the green room, <clears throat> friend of the show, Tyler Adams, popped in, and he – Tyler goes to a lot of Mavs stuff, talks to a lot of Mavs people, and every now and again will, you know, drop a tidbit of something he's heard and yada yada. But he came on the green room and basically said, just out of pure conjecture, and he was like, I wonder if Spencer is the bad vibes guy. He's saying he brought up the podcast that Spencer did and some of the post-game interviews where Spencer was clearly bristling at the fact that, you know, people are claiming Luca needed more help. And you mix all this stuff together and you mix up how many times Spencer just wouldn't fucking pass the ball. Uh, and you see how well the, the ball moved tonight. I can't help but wonder if the Mavericks moved on from Spencer before it became a bigger deal. Is that oh, nuts? No, that's not nuts because I mean, dude, he, this just happened in Washington. Like, mm. like it, <laughs> It's, he became it, the guy I thought he, he like. It, I'm almost wondering because when he first joined, one of my initial takes was right. this dude's. You takes, called it. It's like this dude is not the guy to have when things aren't going well because he gets frustrated. Yeah, and he's you know he's honest to a fault. Like like you said, that Washington 
that Wizards lost those post game quotes, like he wasn't necessarily like wrong but dude you don't say that after a team has beaten you the only two times you've played them this season and then kuzma gets to do the easy dunk and i'm sure guys in that locker room are like dude can you just shut the fuck up because his like, answer his answer was like three minutes long of horseshit yeah and i that was the maddest i've been on the podcast this year because it was like are you fucking kidding me just <laughs> guard someone and right. that's what was so interesting to watch tonight again it's the jazz so i'm probably overreacting but like he was such a negative defensive player. Yes. And how and much like, does that yeah. I'm sorry, I was gonna say, how much does that weigh when you've got a guy who is such a negative defensive player that's so obvious that it shows up in in film sessions that these guys do, and then he's the guy giving those quotes after bad losses and yep. stuff. And it's like that's a that's a really bad combination of... Because you say what you want yeah. about Tim Hardaway. Tim Hardaway is also an awful defender who tries his ass off. Right. So, yeah, you're right. That's, so. Just, that's just that's one of the two kind of things I'm thinking. The second thing I'm thinking is, Christian Wood, do you have your bags packed? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dude, are you ready to go? Yeah. Are, can we be done with the Christian Wood era? I don't know how fair it is. First game back from a broken thumb. I know, but that yeah, that's that's the part. That's the part that sucks. And this is like he got caught on camera like four times. This was the most feel good win of the season, and he's yeah, he's He's fucking big. Chris Stapp's Porzingis energy from that shit, or or six or seven foot uh, Monte Ellis energy. Remember, remember that happened. Remember um, one of the Monte. I can't remember if it was the first Monte. It was the second one because we kind of run out of it. We kind of been tired of his bullshit remember toward the end of the season you know they had already locked up their their playoff seating or whatever they were going to be in the second monte season uh and they played all their young guys remember monte like famously did not like being held out of games like he played all the time and he refused to would come out like he didn't like coming out of games like even if they were winning like he wanted to always be on the floor you want to play every game and they sat him uh in a game that didn't matter toward the end of the season and the mavs played like a lot of reserves and they were winning uh, and they, they they won a game they weren't supposed to win against the team that I think was still maybe playing for something. And the TV just showed shots of Monte like sitting under the basket, like not from the team. I do like his arms this. Crossing, I do uh, remember yeah. that. Is, and by the it, way, that was the last time that was Monte's last season in Dallas. So. I mean, as of as of this writing, I've I've received no no <laughs> direct messages from from pen from pen sack sports or whatever he whatever his agent is because like and you know i i hope if he's not gone and i have to ride out the rest of the season with an awkward thing i don't care just so everybody's clear christian wood's agent would send a copy paste dm to every single person remotely affiliated with mavs fandom or media we're talking 60 to 100 people and there's a great you can go back and look and see who got the text met who got the dm <laughs> because certain people would always share the tweet or the the message verbatim yeah, and it was just... really funny when multiple people would get it where yeah. it's just like josh eberly who is you know a big matt like a mass fan but he's a national media ish guy loves all the league he got he did it like four times brad townsend did it once or twice we all got yeah. caught, and it's just fucking hilarious. So I hope I never have to hear it again. I know. I'm going to peel back the curtain. I don't know if this is going to get – I mean, this isn't going to get us in trouble. No, nobody cares. This the, is like uh, a the last, of a Mavs podcast. The, unless I got took, uh, took an, uh, taken off the DM list, the last DM from Wood's agent was January 13th, and it was best player Luca has ever played with in Dallas. God, that fear, that infuriated <laughs> me. Isn't that and now like he had? There's two hilarious things about that. Obviously, one, it was sent January. Th- it's the last DM he sent since January 13th, so there hasn't been a lot for him to DM about lately. Mm. And now, how hilariously outdated uh, is that tweet with the uh, Kyrie Irving trade? Like, not going to be able to use that point anymore for your contract negotiations, right, Bob. fella. I, I, sorry about you. Well, that's a great opportunity, I think, for us to pivot out and and maybe almost finish this up because we've potted a lot yeah. the last few days. Can um, I make one more point about Dinwiddie before we mm-hmm. go? I, I don't know if mm-hmm. we touched on it. You know, I think it wasn't just the off-court thing. And other people online made this point, so I don't want to act like I'm making a profound, you know, yeah, basketball point. Uh, but, like, you noticed Dinwiddie this season had really fallen in love with trying to be, like, Luca Light. 
Yeah. Especially in the minutes that Luca, you know, when he was running the offense without Luca, like running that same switch heavy attacking scheme, like the bum hunting stuff that we see Luca so good at. And the Mavericks had the worst offense in the league with Luca off and Spencer on. Um, and it was really nice to see tonight. Like they didn't do that. And it's like, I wonder how much that Spencer, Spencer trying to like imitate Luca with the bench lineups uh, didn't play so well because with bench guys, again, especially bench guys, like those guys probably need to touch. You need to share the ball with bench guys because everyone's so limited. Like this isn't breaking news. Like if you've ever even played pickup basketball, you understand when you touch the ball, you feel a little bit more confident in yourself and and on the basketball court. Uh, So when you're playing with a limited group of, of players on the floor with the bench, trying to be, 30 usage rate Luka Doncic uh, with him on the bench is probably not the best uh, way to go about it. So I wonder if some of that uh, contributed to maybe some of the stinkiness as well. Uh, So we'll see going forward. Maybe it did. Maybe it did. Well, um, oh, and you know, I don't want to make it sound like I'm piling on Spencer because Spencer was pretty important to a lot of people this year. I I just, it's just one of those things where it's just like, you see it and you're like, man, this, Sometimes your time runs out and that's been like, that's been Mark Cuban's one of his biggest weaknesses as owner GM is he has not known when to let go the past several years. It's been re- And so it's just like moving on from Spencer, despite Spencer providing a ton of ton yes. of highs. Yes, yes, yes. Is it important. Mm-hmm. It's so important. Anyway, that's how you do business. That's how that's exactly. Yeah, that's how yeah. good teams are built. And so yeah. I'm, you know, I'm very worried about this team's depth. I mean, I think that's okay to say out loud. I don't think anybody yeah. should be mad about that one. Um, no. Why did I? Did I just? And I'm such a moron. I just think I republished something. Whatever. Um. <laughs> so, so the last sort of thoughts before we get out of here. We had a preposterous day at Mavs Moneyball. <laughs> In terms of web traffic and stuff, you know, we we we're all pretty good about juicing the the things which will get people to come to the site. But what we did yesterday is put up a lot of different posts. Xavier Santos wrote a column like within an hour of the trade. He didn't even like read it, and so yeah. I didn't publish it till this morning. But it was called "The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly," which I thought was a really pretty thoughtful column. For immediately after that, our man Brent Brooks <clears throat> put together a piece. Uh, you know, a, vi- a video piece actually of like, you know, just here's some stuff about Kyrie Irving, which I think was was really fun. Um, <clears throat> Brent also wrote a piece, which the comments of this piece are killing me. Like they just they make me mad. But it's it's called the Dallas Mavericks take the marshmallow test after the Kyrie Irving trade, and it it uses um it uses this this 1972 test uh, a marshmallow test that was conducted at Stanford University as a as a uh, jumping off point to talk about how teams have to make choice. And it's like, I like the column a lot. It talks mm-hmm. about like the Mavericks making a choice now versus having to make a choice later. And it's, wouldn't you know it? There's like a third of the comments being like, this study has been since been disproved. This is a, ter-. and it's like, dude, it's a fucking sports call, co- like sports ball column. What do you, it, I really like Brent's column. It's, it's really thoughtful and fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and good. Then, you know, you wrote a – cannot believe you wrote this much. Um, and, and on a Sunday night, like basically a 2,500-word column called the, the Dallas Mavericks have crossed the point of no return with the Kyrie Irving trade that was truly spectacular. That – and it it does the – the you know, if you're – just let me brag on you for a second. It does the everything. It, it's not one thing. It talks about Kyrie off the court. It talks about the Mavericks on the court. It talks about why this is frustrating for us to have to cover. It talks about why the Mavericks could be really good or really bad. It covers the whole spectrum of stuff in a concise amount of, I I just said it was a lot of words, but it does not feel like that because the discussion around Kyrie, if we're just being perfectly clear, is fucking exhausting. And so you have to be exhaustive when you write a column like this, which you just did a really good job with. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, I just felt like we needed, you know, I I was really worried writing it, to be honest, because obviously I included the section uh, about his off the court stuff. That's, and that's just been, 
Well, most most people, and and so it it you know just to pivot to another piece that was about that. Right. Exactly. As our guy, as our guy David Trink wrote a specific column, what it now means to be a Jewish Dallas Mavericks fan, courtesy of Kyrie Irving, and he wrote very eloquently. And he's a young man. He's mm-hmm. younger. You know, I'm not going to tell you his age, but I promise you, he's younger. So for him to write this and kind of put this out there was important. And most of the messages we've gotten about it particularly from from Jewish fans were really like it was meaningful that he wrote this because it's put people in an awkward position and some of the messages that we've received about this which have just cracked me the fuck up where it's like did you go this hard when they hired woman <laughs> I, you know the domestic abuser Jason Kidd and when and when Mark Cuban got got you know the sexual harassment scandal did you guys go this hard at that and it's like yeah motherfucker we did if there's something to bitch about when it comes to the Dallas Mavericks, Mavs Moneyball is going to do it. <laughs> That's the one guarantee we can offer. And I think we covered this whole story with what we know right now before Kyrie's played any basketball. I think we've covered it to the point to where I feel good about where we are because we don't have control of team personnel. We are not going to constantly reference what Kyrie Irving has done off the, off the floor because it's it's done now. If Kyrie continues to do the same dumb shit he has done in every fucking stop for seven years, we're going to cover that too. Okay. I just want everybody to understand this. We are equal opportunity assholes at the Mavs Moneyball website. (laughs) The fact is we sit, we tell, we say how we feel. We have a a very diverse staff of opinions and a people, and I'm going to publish all of those things because a uniformity of thought is boring. You know, we, we had all sorts of different thoughts on Kyrie, where some people just think it's going to be an absolute disaster. But I'm not there yet. I'm mostly there. But I'm I'm willing to be open-minded because I, I'm very interested in it. I mean, I think it was like Ryan Rosillo had probably my favorite take on this. Where he's, yeah. like, he's like, well, Kyrie and Luca are going to go out there and score 40 points apiece, and everybody's going to be talking about how this is, you know, so amazing, and are they the greatest backcourt ever? And then two days later, Kyrie Irving's going to say something insane. It's like, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. probably. Yeah, it's, uh, for me, what it comes down to is, again, I don't want to read, you know, the off the court stuff is always, it's just always going to bug me. I'm going to think about it all the time. And I'm going to think about it like, you know, what David wrote and that and the community of Jewish fans. And, and like, it's not fair that they have to be conflicted when watching a basketball team. Like the basketball is supposed to be the escape, right? So like, mm-hmm. For that to come up in their in the forefront for them when they deal with it in their lives twenty four seven like David is he's Jewish he can't just be not you know what I mean like he can't just I mean, not be who he is anymore. I had a I had a friend of mine, he, but he's a Jewish basketball fan. He told a story to uh, me today about how when he was in grade school, his peers found out that he was Jewish and a vegetarian, and they held him down and forced him to eat pork. Oh, God, as a kid. Okay, so some of the shit that I'm here, it's just like I, you never know what people go through. Right. So like some of like the just unbelievably racist shit that I've had sent to me over the last few days of people who just don't seem to understand that they're being racist drives me crazy. It's right. not something we're going to talk about all the time. It probably hopefully will not be something we bring up again. That would be ideal. Okay, but yeah. I, we have you cannot ignore this stuff. Right. And, and what I, and so like what the crazy thing about the trade is like, it's just kind of like, you talk about like how give it, we're going to see how it goes. It's not a disaster. Technically it's not a disaster yet. We got to see what happens. And it's like, that part's always going to bug me, but there is a part of me that's just like, I mean, I've been wanting roster turnover. I'm really pissed off that they had to get this guy of all the guys to turn it over with. But I'm also like, man, like I'm, we've been wanting new players. Like we want to cycle things out. Like it's just, you know, this season and where the Mavericks are in the standings, like there were, there was a point in time before this trade, like we talked about in Slack, we weren't really advocating for the Mavericks to tank, but we were just like, what are they doing? Like, what's the purpose? Like these wins and like, you know, the wins don't feel impressive. The losses feel really gross. Like there just was a, a stagnation that shouldn't exist when you've got a 23 year old super prodigy star. And it's like, like I'm watching guys I've seen on this team since 2016 and they're really nice guys, but like we're, we're, they're 500, they're almost 500 with this superstar MVP. And it's like, 
where are they going? They don't have any, you know, they don't have any young studs, uh, you know, that, that, you know, that you can reliably bet, you know, it was just bad. Like the team was in a really bad funk um, the last couple of days. And again, I, I wish it wasn't someone with the, the baggage of Kyrie, but yeah. there's another part of my brain. that's like, man, thank God that there's just like a shakeup. Thank God that they're, they're yeah. shuffling the roster around. They're bringing in new players and, you know, still got another couple of days for the trade deadline. So that's the part that like the glass hat full that, that I'm going to kind of be looking at for the rest of the season. Yep. Well, we've had a ton of podcasts the last like 96 hours. It's basically one, it's basically like one and a half a day. Um, I mentioned this the other day. I would still appreciate it. If people went and gave it a listen. Um, all, all the different shows, the speculative stuff that, cause you know, it's fun. It helps us. We're, we're, we work hard, um, but we also do it mainly because we love this. In spite of how much it might seem like the fact that we hate basketball sometimes, <laughs> we we like covering this team. We like doing this together. So, um, thank you so much for hanging out with us for a very long time on a random Monday night podcast. Uh, be looking for the Spotify Live that will go up shortly. Everybody have a great night, and we will talk to you after the Clippers game on Wednesday. Bye, guys.